Okay, this is chapter three, control volume analysis. We're on to a new chapter. In chapters one and two, we covered fluid statics. Now in chapter three, we're going to talk about the analysis of fluid in motion. In other words, fluid dynamics. I've broken this introduction up into two parts. In part 1.1, I'll talk about the three-dimensional vector field representation for the velocity field, which we talked about a bit in chapter one. I'll talk about some simplifications of the three-dimensional field. Sometimes you can assume or you can approximate flows as one-dimensional or two-dimensional. And I'll end by talking about compressible versus incompressible flow. In other words, when you need to include the effect of density variations in your analysis of the flow. And in part 1.2, the next presentation, I'll talk about a whole area of fluid mechanics called flow visualization. So first I thought I'd revisit what we talked about in chapter one, the vector representation of the velocity field. So you may recall that in general, the velocity field V is three dimensional and a function of time. So in Cartesian coordinates, we have at least traditionally in fluid mechanics, we call the X component of velocity U, we call it the Y component of velocity V, and the Z component of velocity W. And each of those velocity components can be functions of three spatial variables and possibly time. If that velocity vector V depends on time, then we say the flow is transient or unsteady. If the velocity vector V has absolutely no time dependence, then the flow is called steady. And here I've shown a high Reynolds number jet issuing into a reservoir. If you were to pick a point in the flow here and measure the velocity, you would find that it would vary randomly with time because this is a turbulent flow. This is an example of a highly unsteady three-dimensional flow. Another way to describe flow is if the flow is one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. Now, most flows in the real world are three-dimensional. In other words, it requires three spatial coordinates to characterize the velocity field. And here I've shown the standard three-dimensional velocity field with U, V, and W velocity components. And in general, each of those velocity components could be functions of three spatial coordinates and possibly time. When we refer to a three-dimensional flow, what we're referring to is the fact that you need three spatial coordinates to characterize that flow. And what I've shown down here is an interesting picture of a airfoil in a flow at a slight angle of attack. And as you may know, the pressure on the bottom of the wing is higher than the pressure on the top of the wing. In fact, that's what keeps the aircraft in the air. And so what happens at the ends of the wings is the flow wants to go from the high pressure to the low pressure. So the flow goes from the bottom of the wing to the top of the wing, but it's also being simultaneously carried downstream. And so we get this lovely corkscrew vortex. And this is an example of a highly three-dimensional flow that happens at the ends of the wing. You can also sometimes approximate a flow as two-dimensional. And here I've shown a two-dimensional velocity field uh, representation where V has just U and V components, and they're only functions of X and Y, so we have W equal to zero. And this sort of situation can happen in the center portion of the wing. This is the same arrangement as I showed in the previous slide, the same wing, but now we're seeing it from a top view. And so what you're seeing is at each end of the wing, you see these corkscrew vortices. This is the highly three-dimensional flow region. Well, as you approach the center portion of the wing, the W component of velocity in the Z direction will go to zero, and you can approximate the flow in this region as two-dimensional. And 
as we'll talk about later in the course and in, in more advanced courses, if you analyze this type of flow, there's some big advantages to being able to approximate a flow as two-dimensional. If you're doing this problem numerically, it requires a lot less computational power and computer memory if you're not storing the information in the third dimension. And in some cases, it's actually useful to approximate a flow as one-dimensional. Here I've written a typical one-dimensional velocity vector. So we only have one component of velocity, in this case in the x direction, that's only a function of one coordinate x. So we have v and w equal to zero. That's a typical one-dimensional flow. And as I mentioned, it's often useful to approximate a flow as one-dimensional. We're going to be doing that quite often in this chapter. The 1D approximation is commonly used in pipe flow, as I've shown below. Now, in a typical pipe flow, uh, where the flow is in the x direction, the u component of velocity in general would be a function of the distance down the pipe, x, as well as r, the radius of the pipe. But in some cases, it's useful to neglect the variation in the r direction and to approximate that flow as just being a function of x. And so this figure here shows the one-dimensional approximation, where we represent the flow as just u of x, where we use the average velocity to characterize the flow, and that average velocity changes with x. We will be using this approximation uh, later in this chapter when we study things like Bernoulli's equation. Next, I'll talk about the difference between compressible and incompressible flow. As we discussed in chapter one, liquids are generally considered incompressible. So in other words, their density is not a function of pressure. So the density is a constant. This is also true for low speed gas flows. At sufficiently low speeds, a gas flow can be approximated as incompressible. And we're gonna be using that fact uh, later in this chapter. Now, you may wonder how fast does a gas have to be going to be considered compressible? Well, a general rule of thumb is that gas flows can be considered incompressible. In other words, the density doesn't vary appreciably, provided the Mach number is less than about 0.3. Above a Mach number of 0.3, you've got to consider compressibility effects, where the Mach number is a dimensionless number. It's the ratio of the velocity of the gas to the speed of sound in the gas. You may be familiar if you've taken a thermodynamics course that the speed of sound in a gas is the square root of KRT, where K is the ratio of the specific heats. So 1.4 for air, R is the gas constant, and T is the absolute temperature. Now we're not gonna be using this expression a lot, but I just mention it to relate it to something you may have learned in a previous course. For air, the speed of sound at room conditions is about 340 meters per second. So considering this rule of thumb, in round numbers, air can be considered incompressible up to about 100 meters per second. I'll end just by showing this very famous photograph by physicist Ernst Mach, which was taken amazingly in 1888. This is a picture of a bullet traveling supersonically. So this is the bullet here. Now, these two white lines here, as I understand it, were the trip wires to trigger the camera. So you can ignore those two wires. What you're seeing here is the, the bow shock, the shock wave off the nose of the bullet, and the air in front of the shock wave has not experienced the pressure wave from the bullet at that point. And so you wouldn't hear the bang from this bullet until that bow shock passed your ears. You can also see a stern shock, shock wave coming off the back end of the bullet. Here you can see the density variations in the turbulent wake of the bullet, which is pretty amazing considering that this was taken in 1888. It's a pretty major achievement for its day. And so that completes this presentation.